Hello, fellow Emersonians. I am Nancy Isaacs, proud graduate of the class of 1979, resident of Los Angeles, and president of your Emerson College Alumni Association. On behalf of the Alumni Association and Emerson College, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our first ever digital edition of the annual Alumni Achievement Awards. These awards celebrate the achievements of four extraordinary alumni. By honoring them, we honor the significant impact Emersonians make in the world and the many lives they touch. We also honor the values that Emerson has instilled in all of us to explore and push the boundaries of communication, art, and culture. As you listen to the stories of these incredible alumni, I ask you to think also about the incredible alumni you might know, alumni making a difference, perhaps under the radar, in their communities and companies. Whose story would you have wanted to hear when you were a student? What inspirational paths are your alumni friends forging? Nominations for these awards come from you and we wanna hear from you. So visit emerson.edu slash alumni to nominate an alum, check out upcoming events, or even update your contact information. Emerson College has touched our lives and we have influenced Emerson's story as well. This is certainly true today as our alumni community continues to connect with each other when we need each other the most. Community has taken on a deeper meaning for all of us during this time as the connections that we value like those in the Emerson Alumni Association are truly a lifeline. The Alumni Association has found new ways to connect us and strengthen our community. One of the most powerful is Emerge, a new online community where Emersonians can connect, recognize, support, and celebrate each other. If you haven't yet, please join the conversation at emerge.emerson.edu. We are also really proud of our new Alumni Association podcast called Making It Big in 30 Minutes. Hosted by alumna Terry Chispicio, it's a podcast for, by, and about the Emerson community and the many ways our alumni are making the world a little better every day. Check it out wherever you like to listen. And if you don't yet, please follow Emerson Alumni Association on Facebook, Instagram, and join our group on LinkedIn to stay up to date on all of our virtual programs and news from the college. Finally, I wanna say a huge thank you to you. Emerson alumni have rallied around our community these past several months, being there for each other through global pandemic and deep social unrest in our country. You've also rallied your support in so many ways for our future alumni, our students. Thank you for talking in virtual classes, participating in student events, and career sessions, and of course, making donations to help students whose circumstances have dramatically and drastically changed during COVID. What's evident to all of them and to me is that with alumni like you in their corner, their futures are incredibly bright and their community is strong. So thank you for being part of One Emerson. Hi everyone, thank you all so much for joining us as we honor our 2020 Alumni Association Award recipients. I'm Megan Mitchell, I am a graduate of Emerson College class of 2014. I am on the alumni board and I'm a news anchor in Cincinnati, Ohio. So the Distinguished Alumni Award is the highest honor bestowed upon an alum by the Emerson College Alumni Association. Now this award recognizes an individual's significant achievements and contributions to their profession or their community. It was established back in 1978 and it honors and acknowledges an individual's service to society and personal commitment to the mission of Emerson College. Established in 2003, the Young Alumni Award is bestowed upon an alum who's graduated within the last 10 years and has made significant achievements and contributions to their professions and their communities. This year, our Distinguished Alumni Award recipients are Adele Lim, class of 96, Peter Loge, class of 87, and Brian Smith, class of 95. Our Young Alumni Award goes to Brittany Martin Porter, class of 2010. So let's take a look at some of their incredible achievements.
need to write from a place of joy that if you have this scene and this scene is killing you, you're like, oh my God, it's so boring. If you find it boring, the whole world is going to feel it's boring. The language of communications, the language of rhetoric, uh, semiotics, metaphor, and the role in creating war, creating peace, getting people to join war, getting, getting people to, to mobilize for peace, is thousands of years old. I think the media are trying to highlight this and really trying to be fair because they know there are people out there who want to say, look, it's just the media, the media are behaving badly, the media are being hypocritical. They want to avoid that. And the Ebby goes to Brian Smith for Brian's Room compilation. We started out with a huge crew at the beginning. We started at the end of the year last year, and then uh, some of the people ended up going other places, but we ended up with the best of the best, I think. And uh, just want to thank everybody. Thanks a lot. And of course, they, like everybody else in the room, there's a couple hundred people that are uh, that go to work, not just as a job, but to put in their own passion and pride in the show. And this is one that we set up as figureheads, of course, to receive something like this. But it represents everybody who's involved with it. And we've been a family for a number of years to do this show. So on their behalf, I say thank you very much. It's an honor. Today we have a unique opportunity to speak with three of our award winners and hear more about their journeys from Emerson student to successful professionals. So of course, the first question we all have to ask is, you know, how did your experience at Emerson end up preparing you for your career? And so we'll start with you, Adele, and just kind of bring us through, you know, why you went to Emerson, your major, and how you kind of got to where you are. I really credit Emerson for me being in America to begin with. I was a student in Malaysia, I had never thought that I would end up living in the States. And the British system, you know, is very British, it's very regimented. And I think I got a, an Emerson prospectus and I was going through it and I came home wild with excitement. I told my mother, I can major in writing and dance. Who's ever heard of this? This is a crazy Disneyland. It just doesn't exist in Southeast Asia. So um, got over here and I would say the thing that really, um, you know, looking back on it, Emerson just gave us so much freedom to create. They didn't, you know, really try to put or impose their aesthetics or, you know, one point of view on you. It was, here's a camera, here's a crew, you know, go out there, make all the mistakes in life and, you know, you can, um, you know, you'll be your best teacher, your best critic. And they were right. Absolutely. Brittany, Peter, either one of you want to jump in? I, it, it's funny, you know, Adele and I are, are separated um, by a lot of years at Emerson, and her experience is exactly mine. Um, I went to Emerson initially to make movies, uh, not to make films. I wanted to blow things up. Star Wars changed my life. I wanted to do that. I got to Emerson and found out that they, they make films, and it's hard, it turns out. So I, I switched to television, because how hard could that be? Uh, my classmates included Max Munchnik and Jay Beanstalk. So I went to political communication, because really, that was kind of the fallback position. And, but, but the experience was, this, was the same as Adele's. It was, here's an opportunity, seize it. If you blow it, get up, figure out what you did wrong, go do something else. If you, if you succeed, that's terrific. What are you doing next? I agree. I, I didn't know what I wanted to go to Emerson for when I initially went. Um, I knew I wanted to work in entertainment. I figured, how do you uh, make, I guess, a career out of entertainment and what's the route? And I actually met Pete Chavney, Chavney, on my um one of my first weeks there and and i was an athlete and he he worked very closely with the soccer team and he was like well you gotta you gotta go tr try the evies like you have to get involved in the evies and i was like sure and and then he sort of guided me to to major in television and i went to that first meeting at the evies and 
sort of got sucked into live television and it was kind of like from there on no turning back and what i loved about emerson exactly what adele and peter were saying is you kind of you learn by trying and you learn by doing you don't learn from books you don't learn from watching film or tv you learn by actually doing and meeting people and and you know your your call i'm sorry your classmates are so important because they inevitably become your network and you end up utilizing them well after you graduate. So it's really a place to meet people, to work with people, and to just learn by trial and error and um, experience. I'm gonna actually go off of what Brittany was talking about because um, you know I don't know if this would be it for you. The Evies have this kind of pivotal experience at Emerson that that ended up shaping your career. Um, if if you could go a little bit more in depth as to how that that really shaped what you wanted to do, even if you didn't go into Emerson necessarily thinking you wanted to do television, uh, what was that one thing at Emerson for everyone? We'll start with you. Uh, that really shaped who you ended up being and what you ended up doing. I um, so obviously I got involved with the Evies, and then I also had the opportunity to do the Kevin Bright workshop, which was to um, classes per semester where you were working towards the end goal of a production. So um, both of those were multi-camera television productions, uh, Evie's and that, that's, that semester of Kevin Bright. Um, but I also took this one class, um, which was assisted directing like film ADing. And I thought it was kind of badass to try to be a woman AD because it's not really that common. So I was really going back and forth between the two. And, and actually because of Emerson, at um, I went to the LA program and I got to intern at two places. I didn't really tell them I was interning at the second place. I did, I did one for credit and one on the side. Um, but one was film AD in the AD department and one was at Comedy Central and, with Doug Herzog. And it was kind of, uh, I, I ended up working on both. And then I decided that film probably wasn't for me. It is very hard. It is a lot of hours. Like I, my first call time was two in the morning and I was like, mm, I'm, I am all set. I like schedule. I like, you know, more, you know, reliable hours. So that's sort of how I ended up in television, I guess. I, I did love my experience on film, but um, yes, it was, it was because of the Evies. I got to really experience as close as possible to what it was like in the in the real world as far as live television production multi-camera production wasn't concerned so it, it helped immensely when i got out of school jumping off what uh, Brittany was saying you know there's that one i don't know if there's one pivotal experience but the great thing about uh, the emerson experience was giving you a, a breadth of different production type experiences. So you knew what maybe you wanted to do, but as importantly, you knew what you were not prepped for. So, you know, you have a thing of what's it, what it's like to direct a live television show and, you know, you tape your performance as the director in that booth, you know, yelling like, you know, ready one, take one. And when, you know, you I heard the recording of myself in that, I was like, wow, I am a psycho and not ready for live TV or, you know, um, being behind the camera this way. Um, but I will say that I think, you know, um, part of part of coming out to Hollywood and being successful or even getting your foot in the door is this sort of baseless self-confidence. And, you know, weirdly like Emerson, you know, helps kind of like prop you up for that. I had, you know, because we have our version of the Emmys, the Evies, and I had this ridiculous, awful senior short I did that got nominated and you feel like a million bucks, you know, you're just like, I can do this. Like I might have what it takes. And you, I mean, again, you look back on it years later going like, oh, this was utter garbage, but you know, and like have, being able to do it with your uh, with your peers, having it celebrated by your peers, you know, just kind of sets you up, makes you feel like, you know, you, you have what it takes to jump in and really, you know, on top of the experience, sometimes that's all you need. You know, it's funny, I, I had a similar experience. I also worked at EIV and I worked on the EVs, won a couple of EVs with Michael Booth, right? Franco Barrio, Max Munchenich, people like that. Um, and wow, I was not cut out for that. I had a similar experience of like, this is fun, this is exciting. These people, these my classmates are really good at it. I should probably do do something else. And for me, it was the forensics team, uh, both speech and debate. And and we were on the road a lot. We were really, really good, actually. And the school put a lot behind us. Um, I also played soccer, but sort of played soccer at Emerson. Now it's a real thing. 
then it was it was not really a real thing. The debate team was kind of we were the jocks, and and that's but it's a similar attitude. Like we had no idea that we were out of our depth, and we started winning because of course you do, and you make some huge mistakes and you win some stuff. But it was the the friendships, the things I learned, learning how to fail, learning how to work under pressure, um, you know, learning how to handle it when you win when you when you're not expected to. It was really. It was, it was that for me, um, in addition to learning what I was bad at or not as good at as, as some of my classmates. I, I love all of these answers because I feel like I had the exact same experience in terms of just having that confidence that might not have been too real. I mean, it was, it was real at the time. Was it, let's just say I got into my field and I very quickly realized that I wasn't the greatest of all time even though I did win the Evie, but it, it did give you that confidence and it put you right in, in like the room where it happens, um, which I, I always appreciated about Emerson. Um, so for any of the recent graduates out there, cause we are the alumni board, uh, what would you say to them, you know, who are going into their field hyped up on a lot of confidence? Um, what would you say to them? Uh, how, how should they not give up? How should they kind of keep applying and, and doing what they want to do and doing what they're meant to do? I think, you know, in this day and age, uh, two things. Um, a lot of it is just perseverance. You're going to get in there. They're going to people, be people who are better connected than you. There's going to be somebody, you know, with an uncle in UTA and somebody in, you know, Sony that can hook them up and it's not you. And, you know, it's just, it's really persistent. There's, there's going to be people who are more talented than you right out of the gate. Um, but really, it's all about really, really, um, you know, asking yourself the hard question, is this what I want to do with my life? And if it is, you know, be serious about it and you stick with it and you find, you know, so that when the opportunity shows up, you're going to be ready for it. But the other thing I wanted to bring up, there was um, a recent news article of um, three Emerson graduates, I think, um, you know, at a, at a production company where there was a, you know, there was widespread, you know, toxic, abusive behavior. And we're at this point of change in Hollywood. I really believe that having worked here for 20 years, there's much more awareness of it. Um, and there was always this feeling of, you know, you don't snitch, you don't complain, you know, because you're not going to be hireable. And it took a lot of bravery for those three young Emerson graduates to stand up for themselves and say, no, like this is not acceptable behavior. And so I feel like, you know, all, you want to be a team player, you want to go out there, you know, you want to try give it your best, but also to be very cognizant of what is and is not acceptable behavior and to advocate for yourself because, you know, you have resources out there now, we're here for you, we're waiting, there are people who, you know, who will be on your side. So, you know, to have that awareness coming out here. You know, I think what you said is so important. Um, for me, there are a couple of parts of Emerson that are really special. One is just the constant hustle. It's the constant work ethic. You want to get ahead, hustle, right? Find an opening, move into an opening. I've had talks with classmates recently, um, some of whom have been very successful, some less so, or have bad luck or bad breaks. We're trying to find the difference, like what makes it a bit of a difference? And part of it is uh, Speaks, who's a classmate, owns Hyperion Pub in, in LA, Go. He just, he was just the hero in Celebrity Family Feud. Check it out. And he just never stops hustling, right? And that's so true of so many of my classmates who I know are successful. The other half of it, though, I think Adele really hits on, and that's the other, one of the other things that makes Emerson special, is we're not a place where you learn, learn the tricks, right? We're a place committed to communication to, to advance society, right? I mean, it's not for nothing that, that Charles Wesley Emerson said, Emerson said, expression necessary to evolution, right? Is what President Pelton exemplifies every day. We are there to make the world more entertaining, right? To make people laugh, but to make us a little bit smarter, maybe to make us a little bit uncomfortable, maybe to, to advocate for the kind of change you need to, need to see in the world. So it's not just the tricks and the tools, right? It's for a purpose, it's for a meaning. And that was driven home in every single class I had was that we are giving you tools that others don't have. And these are the most important tools, of, tools in a democracy. Use them. I completely agree about uh, perseverance as well. And, and another, point where you hit um, Adele saying that you you know you may not be well connected I used to I when I moved out to LA I was kind of you know it's hard not to be frustrated when you see uh, you know or some of your classmates having more opportunities right off the bat because they know people and I didn't I had no one I didn't know a single person in the inter entertainment industry but what did help me was that Emerson connection and it, it was amazing how far it actually reached. I mean, I got, that's how I got both of my internships was 
because this, the AD and co-producer of The Hangover happened to be the producer on the fourth Evie's. And he got my, I, I, and I blindly sent him my resume. And I was like, there's no way. I'm just going to send it to every production, film production company in LA and hope someone replies. And lo and behold, J.P. Wetzel, he saw it. He worked on the Evies when he was at Emerson and I got hired as his, you know, that was my internship. And I, it was all luck. And, and a lot of it is, a lot of it is luck and timing. Um, but that's why perseverance is important because even though it doesn't, if it doesn't happen for you right out of college, if you keep hustling and keep working for a few more years, your shot's going to come as long as you um, stay focused and you work really hard and you leave a good impression wherever you go. I think that's incredibly important. Um, but yeah, it is a lot of luck and timing and people hit their strides when they hit their strides. It's not, it, it, you shouldn't compare yourself to other people who hit it earlier or later or anything. It's, it's really hard not to do that comparison. And I know all of us have fallen into it, but the Emerson network is incredibly important. Part of it for the, for the um, business end of it. When I went out on my own as a lobbyist, I was at a firm, went out and started my own shop. Ben DeBona was one of my first clients and he took a flyer on me. He knew me a little bit because I was president of the alumni board. Um, but I was Emerson and we had a terrific working relationship for, for uh, several years, right? So those relationships do matter, but it's also the authentic relationships. The, one of my closest friends is a kid named Josh Nauer, no longer a kid, who's the first person I met at Emerson. He handed me my key to my dorm room. Uh, my other closest friends include people I met freshman year, um, and we've all moved to different trajectories and different speeds, right? Some have success early, Brittany, as you said. Some find their feet later, but we're always there for each other. Mm -hmm. right, Paul Tetro, who was a senior and I was a freshman, lives around the corner from me, and he runs Ford's Theater. Um, and we've it's, it's that, right? It's the authentic relationships as well as the professional connections. My, my first job at a college, um, anchor job in Bismarck, North Dakota, was given to me basically by uh, an Emerson alumni who I'd never met before, but saw my stuff. I was taking it from an alumni of Emerson. So this anchor position was just held uh, by a recent graduate. So it, it's crazy, the network that we have in all fields, in journalism, in television, in film. Um, but I, of course, am not an award recipient of the alumni board. You all are. So if you could talk a little bit about what it means to you to be able to receive this award. It, it means the world to me. Um, in many ways, Emerson's home. Um, I learned how to be who I am at Emerson. Um, my closest friends, as I said, are people I met. I met at Emerson. Um, I learned how to think about the world. I learned you could do politics for a living. I didn't know you could do that. I'm also a professor at George Washington University. When I teach, I try to channel Walt Littlefield. Um, and one of the most powerful teaching tools he ever had was, I don't know, what do you think? Uh, I, it's, a, it's a weird, special little place um, that, that made me, in many ways, who I am. Whatever success I've had, whatever wound up resulting in that thing, is, is down to, to Emerson College. My, my basic rule of thumb is if Emerson calls, the answer is yes. Winning this award really sort of brings it full circle for me. Before I got to Emerson, I I didn't really know what it is I wanted to do other than, you know, it was loosely in communications. I had always been a writer, but I didn't know that TV writing was something one could do, um, you know, given my background. And, you know, I, I was very much an outsider, an immigrant, you know, like um, a person of color. And I got to try all these different things that I would never have had the opportunity to do back where I grew up. And, you know, getting this, um, and it really put me in touch with people who talked about their dreams and what they wanted to go out to Hollywood to do. And again, it was all like this sparking thing in my brain of like, who the hell knew? Um, so, and, I, and, I, and when I drove out to LA, I did it, you know, with my boyfriend who I met at Emerson and going out there as young kids with this crazy dream that sort of took seed at Emerson. Um, and, you know, I'm here 20 years later as a, as a Hollywood writer, and it would never have happened had I not had those early years in Boston, like trudging around the snow in Back Bay, trying to shoot things with batteries, you know, in, held in your pocket close to your body so it doesn't lose its charge. Like it all kind of came from there. So getting this award, you know, after all that time, you know, it means it, it is so meaningful. And so, yeah, <laughs> it's a very moving experience. I agree. I, uh, it, 
it it feels really nice. I don't know. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I, what Peter said, Emerson is home. It, it really, truly is. And I and I have the same um, mentality. Anytime Emerson calls, I I don't say no for anything, um, because I know how beneficial it was for me and you know, my husband. I met at Emerson. My best friends, um, who are still out here because of the LA program, we all sort of moved together, and it didn't feel like we were moving to a crazy big city all alone because we all had this support system already. It almost sometimes we would joke, like we would go to like a party and it was like, are we still in college? Cause they're all the same people here. But it's good because, you know, like Peter said, everyone grows into their own um, fields and their own specialties. And then that becomes um, the people you can call when you need things. Like I need an editor, I got a guy. I know a group of friends who just started a production company and it's all Emerson kids. Um, so yes, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. It feels awesome to be rewarded. Um, I don't feel very young <laughs> because I've been working so damn hard for a decade, but, um, but I'm very appreciative. So obviously we talked a little bit about this in the beginning, but we're in a really tough time right now for Hollywood, for theater, um, politics, you know, can be stepping up if, if, and when they want to do that. <laughs> um, but if you could talk a little bit about how your job, your career has really kind of shifted or changed in this pandemic and how you've had to deal with that. My so. job has changed immensely. Um, for one, we were in the middle of a season when this happened. And um, we were actually sitting around the table at a casting pitch for the next season. I work on The Voice. And we were in the middle of the season and actually the, the, the part of the job that I focus on most is the live shows. I'm, I'm the live stage producer. Um, that's sort of my world. And we were heading into live shows and this pandemic happened and it slowly went to, okay, how are we gonna do this? We need to wait and see, study the guidelines and no one's flying out. How do we finish the season and how do we do it remotely? Which was horrifying and hard it was very hard and zoom like who knew what zoom was a year ago and then it became the pivotal tool to like making television during a pandemic it was insane we were we were sending things to contestants in their homes across the country talking to them via zoom like okay put that light there and can you hang that like it was insane creating per live performances i I'm amazed how we did it. Luckily, now we have the ability to work in person with extreme, extreme restrictions. So I'm starting to go in next week for my the first time because I also had a baby in the middle of it. But um, I'm going in next week and we're only allowed a certain amount of people in the lot. It is only like essential workers. So wh where we would normally shoot with 450 staff and crew, we can only have 100 people on the lot. So everyone is doing five jobs. They're doing jobs that they usually don't do. They, um, we're a singing show. So there's a ton of restrictions because singing sends particles. <laughs> there's a whole thing. I am well versed in COVID compliance and testing. And yeah, I mean, it's a safe way forward. It's tough. I, I do feel bad for alumni coming out right now because it's probably hard to find a job because we can only hire a hundred people to be on site. I can't imagine what other productions can do if they can even start. Um, so yeah, it's changed dramatically, but I'm glad that we're at a place now where we can actually work in person as opposed to working remotely via Zoom because that was incredibly difficult. I felt lucky before, before Brittany. Now I feel exceedingly lucky. Um, you know, I, I'm a college professor most of the time, and, and I, I do that from right here. I've been sitting in this chair, I think, for six months. Um, and it's been rough on the students, but at least we had a half a semester together before everybody went home flown remotely. So we had a bit of a relationship. Trying to establish relationships with students is tricky because we're all remote. Um, Emerson's doing a terrific job of bringing people back. GW is a bit of a different kind of a school, so we, we didn't feel like we could do that. Um, it's changing politics a lot. Um, because you can't really canvas door to door. Field operations look really different than they used to. Uh, there's a lot of virtual campaigning. Fundraising has changed. Um, a lot of it is a lot of it is really drastically changed. I think it's changed sort of the certainly changed the political environment. Um, and it's also 
it's one of the other things I, I do a lot is I do a fair amount of uh, press interviews and, um, you know, I don't do them in person anymore. Um, I had a request yesterday actually from an international network to do a stand up on the mall. I said, you know what, actually, no, um, I'm going to, I'll do it from here. Um, so it's, it's changing that, but not as drastically as, certainly not as Brittany. And if I were still, you know, in the administration or on the Hill or something, um, it'd be much, much, much different. Um, I, I live more in Brittany's world, I think. And just to put it out there, everything's a garbage fire right now. And there's no getting away from it. I think that you, all we can do is make peace with that. Um, so logistically, yes, it is, it is a nightmare because for production, you live and die by your prep. And you can't plan for something if the goalposts are constantly moving and we live in this uncertain environment. But so we make peace with that. But I will say, you know, uh, if you look at the latent benefits or the good that came out of this, I think it's a couple of things. Um, first, you know, there, the demand for content is huge. So, you know, right when the pandemic broke, right before this, we have all these streamers like Amazon, Hulu, Apple TV, um, Disney Plus, you know, people, uh, companies were getting onto streaming without necessarily even having the content to put, they just knew they needed to get in the game. And there's this huge demand for content and suddenly everything grinds to the screeching halt. So it's cold comfort now, but no, know, know that in the coming years, even if you can't get that internship this year, even if you can't get that job this, you know, this year, do what you can, you know, to like, you know, pay your bills up absolutely, but to get yourself ready for when the floodgates do open, that you're gonna be there and you're gonna be ready. Uh, I think that's one benefit. And the other thing is because we've all had time to sort of reflect and again, what the, what the garbage fire has taught us is that there are a lot of issues, um, you know, at society at large, you know, aside from the administration, aside from COVID, that uh, problems that we were not facing like grownups, whether it's, um, you know, misogyny or um, race representation, um, you know, behaviors in the workplace, how we are, you know, why we're telling the stories we're telling, how we're telling the stories we're telling. And with all this awareness and, you know, uh, every, I think, you know, the studios, the content creators were really internalizing right now. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the next chapter in Hollywood is going to look like. So, you know, you can, again, garbage fire, but also exciting time for reinvention, you know, and setting yourself up for what's to come. And it, feel, it feels like an Emerson moment. Listening to Brittany and Adele, it really feels like an Emerson moment. It's, we got into this because you believe in things, right? It's entertainment, but it's also, hey, we're kind of racist, so we should probably you know, maybe not do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but also, like, you want a group of people who can go from a staff of 400 to a staff of 100. I want 100 Emerson people doing that. Because they're going to ask what needs to be solved. No one's going to say, I'm sorry, that's not my job. They're like, okay, you need cable strong? Great. What do you need? I, I took a class on lighting. I can do that. Mm -hmm. Hey, by the way, if you looked at the, the cast on this show, maybe we can have a different kind of a cast. Why is the entire senior production team white guys? Like, I know a guy. As you said, Brittany, I know somebody. Yeah. Got a guy who'd be, who, uh, who'd be great at this. The Got guy, by the way, is a black <laughs> woman. So it really feels like, I mean, it's all kinds of awful, um, but it, it really does feel like an Emerson, Emerson moment and, and Emerson students and alumni are really poised to seize whatever comes next. Absolutely. And just to add on to that, you know, we're hustlers, we're scrappy. And if you went through the program, you know, whether or not you liked it, you had to, you know, you had to move a studio camera and you had to go be the sound guy on, you know, somebody else's production. And it's just, I think, the breadth and the scope of experiences and not being precious about anything and being, you know, knowing how to pivot. Um, I think that's really going to help all Emersonians like moving forward. This Emerson experience, Peter, you mentioned this, Adele, you mentioned this as well, which is that, you know, when I was at Emerson, like, yes, I was in those classes that like got me right in front of a broadcast camera. Amazing, wonderful. But I was also taking feminism courses and I was also taking queer dreams classes and the, the class was called queer dreams. And I was like, this is crazy and weird. I love it. And so, whereas so many of my colleagues today who went to incredible journalism schools, aren't as well versed on those social issues, social justice issues. So this time has been a moment of reflection for so many people, but I feel very blessed to be uh, you know, a product of Emerson where I was able to tap into my empathy there, tap into my understanding of politics there in a way that has improved my workplace, hopefully, um, in a way that has improved the coverage that I've been able to give to uh, especially minority communities in, in the place that I'm in. So 
I do appreciate that, you know, dichotomy of finding, you know, your skill, doing that, getting right in front of the camera, getting behind the camera, but also being able to understand kind of the meaning behind it all. And I think that this is a moment of reflection. So I appreciate uh, looking forward to what's to come in Hollywood, to what's to come in politics. Um, but for each one of you guys individually, I mean, what are you looking forward to next? Uh, any big projects? Feel free to kind of shout it out. Give yourself that, that little uh, <laughs> moment to shine. Well, just to circle back before the moment to shine on me a bit. But, you know, we talk a lot about Emerson in terms of how it preps you for, you know, communications and entertainment. That's that part of it. But, you know, as you brought up, we don't want to ignore the amazing education I got at Emerson. You know, I love that you had queer studies. Like, where was queer studies when I was there? But it was my first um, exposure to Katha Pollitt, Samantha Power, Susan Faludi, like amazing feminist writers. And I didn't grow up, um, you know, with those thinkers, with those um, uh, um, with those modes and just being able to form, you know, who you are as an adult, because that's also part of the college experience. You're not shot into Hollywood thinking like, I have a strong point of view. Like, you know, you come out here, you're 21, you don't know anything. You know, it's about how those experiences and what you've been taught at school, what you learned at school, then, you know, being shoved into the real world, you being able to absorb all of that and, you know, have a point of view, have a voice. And when you talk about what's, um, you know, what's next i feel like there's a great hunger for authenticity now whether it's in our politicians or in our in our programs um a lot of tv shows and movies you know have this really strong fresh point of view that people identify with even if they have nothing in common with you know the comic or the artist um you know who created it because they can feel that string of human connection and authenticity um so i would you know i'm really looking forward to that um, in terms of what's, you know, in the pipeline for me, I think, um, again, with the turn in Hollywood, you know, I felt like there was one monolithic way of, you know, telling story. And now we're just kind of blowing it wide open. And with streaming, you know, you didn't, you don't, you don't longer need um, a TV show or movie that's going to appeal to absolutely everybody. You can make it to appeal to people, you know, are going where it's going to resonate. And if it resonates with a small group, it has a bigger chance of resonating, you know, nationally or even globally. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I spent 16, 17 years of my life writing for one hour network, primetime TV, most of the time with like a white guy lead who was like an alien, an FBI agent, you know, I want to be able to do all those things, you know, like, but tell those stories for everyone. Um, so I have, um, I just came off of a Disney animated feature called Raya and the Last Dragon, which is a fantasy, but inspired by the cultures of Southeast Asia. Um, I, uh, some friends and I, for the hell of it, wrote this um, ratchet, raunchy, um, girls, Asian girls trip thing, uh, where a bunch of thirsty Asian American girls go to Asia, you know, look into, um, you know, but you can just tell all those stories now. And the difference between now and 10 years ago is like, you know, we sold it. Like you can sell those things. You can sell things that speak specifically to you. You don't have to force your individual experience through this weird prism to, uh, uh you know, to appeal to what you think is like, you know, a, the American mainstream audience. Um, they will, they will find you. The audience is always so much more sophisticated and, you know, thoughtful and open than I think, uh, the traditional studios think they are. I really want to echo what Adele said um, about about the the liberal arts and the thinking, right? I mean, at Emerson, I learned how to figure out the technical bits, right? How to run a campaign. Okay, got it. You know, and campaigning has changed a lot since I was an undergraduate in the mid '80s in Boston. But like, you figure it out. But but the important piece wasn't piece wasn't that. The really important piece for me was from the late Walt Littlefield, Michael Brown, Greg Payne. It was having to read Aristotle, Plato. Uh, classical rhetorical theory. How do people think? How do we construct our world through language? How can we maybe change our world through language? What role does that play? What are our responsibilities in that? So much so that in one of my previous positions, I was the VP of an independent federal agency. My teams, actually, it turns out, had a drinking game that every time I said Aristotle, they had to take a shot. <laughs> it's, but, but, but it's that, right? It's the combination of the theory to practice and bring theory to practice. There's not some artificial wall between them. Right? Theory should inform our practice and practice should inform our theory. And how do we make it better and get better? Now, how do we get it done? Which I think is kind of the, uh, the special sauce of Emerson College for me. 
my big thing next is kind of something I've started. It's an interesting question. I've never thought about what comes. Also, I'm an Emerson student. What comes next? I don't know. I, what do you think? <laughs> like, it's only Friday afternoon. I've got, it's weeks before Monday morning. Um, I recently launched a project on ethics on political communication to study the, to promote the study teaching practice of political communication ethics. Seems like it should be a thing. It used to be a thing. Aristotle, Plato, Quintilian, Cicero, it was all philosophy, rhetoric, and politics were all the same. And, and I think it ought to be a thing again, and not in a civil kumbaya, can we all get along? That would be nice. Let's please stop campaigning at 11. Just please, everybody stop shouting. But also, how do we just behave more ethically? Like we have an ethical responsibility to, to a system in which I've been incredibly privileged to work, right? I've worked in the House and the Senate and the administration, and that's, I consider that a, a, a privilege and at some level public service because I'm trying to make the world better. And we ought to be able to have a society which is partisan, which is sharp elbowed and hard hitting because fierce debate is necessary in a democracy, but do so in a way that doesn't undermine the premises of that democracy. And actually in a bit of an Emerson brag, I'm just gonna name check all the Emerson people I can think of at the moment. Um, I recently edited a, a, a book I, re I edited recently came out on political communication ethics and theory and practice. And half the chapters are by academics saying one ought and half are by practitioners, basically friends of mine writing about speech writing and lobbying and stuff. Uh, one of the chapters is written by Mark McPhail. He graduated a couple of years ahead of me. He and his late brother, Roger, were legends at Emerson. He's a rhetoric professor. And he wrote about um, ethical rhetoric and um, a moment in the civil rights movement that he doesn't think gets enough attention. And we have an ethical responsibility, actually, to Adele's point, to be brave. You actually have an ethical responsibility to rhetorically speak up. That's, you have to do that in a democracy. So I got to draw on Mark. Hey, I'm doing this thing. I want to help. And another chapter uh, on digital ethics was co-authored by Professor Vincent Raynaud, um, a digital professor at Emerson who's a rising academic rock star. So I'm doing this thing. Who am I going to call first? Got to call Emerson. I uh, don't know what's next. Uh, I, you know, I've been at my job and I've been incredibly lucky to have the job that I've had. And I've grown through the, um, the production in the past decade, 10 years we've been on the air, which is insane. Um, I think what I am most interested in is what Adele's talking about with the in, um, increase of streaming production or, or productions that are going to streaming. I, I ever, I've been so, I'm so well versed in like the 11 act structure of a two hour show on primetime network television that it's like, how do you reimagine now um, what I do, which is reality television or music television for the streaming audience? Because it's different. It's, I don't know necessarily if the voice can translate to a streaming audience, but what is that next production that can in that same sphere? Um, what, is, what is music television going to become? Um, it's, it's kind of exciting to figure it out. Um, it's grown so much since, you know, MTV in the nineties till now. And a lot of my coworkers st were at MTV in the nineties, um, which I feel so grateful to work amongst those people because what people to work amongst. Um, so that, and also just being like a new mom trying to navigate working, like, it's really harder than people let up. <laughs> like, I mean, women do have it a little tough and, and you're expected to work full time, but also be a fully present mother and learning that balance in Hollywood is gonna be my next great adventure. <laughs> uh, just a quick thing, I wanna amplify what Brittany's saying. She's got a young baby at home. I have an eight and 11 year old. Um, and I think if there's anything the pandemic has taught us, it's that it's forced, it's a forced Sabbath for, you know, a, a lot of working professional parents. Um, the way, the way in Hollywood and, and with many industries uh, across the states, you're expected, you find your value in how hard you work in working 15, 18 hour days. And that really isn't great for anybody. And it takes an unfair toll on, on working mothers, you know, to, and it's a thing, it's a dirty secret we don't like to talk about because, um, you know, uh, a lot of working women have this attitude of, I just have to do it. I have to not complain. I have to put up with all this garbage at work and, you know, see my kids for 45 minutes a day. And that's just the way it is. It's not. And it really is on us to advocate for ourselves to, you know, push. Um, and again, I think we're at a point where, you know, the women who, uh, who are already here 
are fighting for the women coming up behind us um, and, you know, really kind of forcing the conversation to be about the only way you make a workplace more open and equitable for all is to, you know, for us to like take a good hard look at working conditions and what expectations are and understanding that it's not just, you know, a concession, you know, feel good concession. It really, I feel like as a content creator, having a more balanced life, you know, having more time, empathy, like in um, a, wind, a mind that works, you know, free of um, chemicals, let's say, <laughs> and built, you know, the way like a lot of people do to like kind of push through that makes you a better, more authentic storyteller. Um, and, you know, the more we can talk about this and push for this, I think the better for all. 100%. And it helps you be more creative. You need to sort of I mean, I, I worked very, very hard throughout my, my 20s. I, I think that I just didn't really experience my 20s as a normal, you know, young person because I just, like Adele said, I was like, I need to work the hardest in order to be recognized. And I do think the pandemic is helping people realize working conditions need to be addressed in the industry because even now, I mean, there was this little bit at the beginning of the pandemic where it's like, your home is your work now. And where are the lines? It's all blurred together. Like you wake up and it's like, I guess I have to start working because I'm at work. You know, here it is. It's all the same. So, and especially with kids, it's like, you re we really need to find work-life balance in this industry for sure. It's something that needs to be addressed and hopefully these change, these change in working conditions will help, you know, highlight those problems. I am feeling inspired and I didn't even go into this panel thinking that I was going to end up feeling inspired. It's been so nice to kind of see all of you guys uh, and what you're doing and, and how your success is going. And hopefully, you know, one day I, others that are watching this can, can strive for that as well. And we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, Adele, Brittany, Peter, thank you all so much. And I'll wrap it up there. Thanks, everyone.